It is 451 AD. Attila had destroyed everything in his path as he galloped through Gaul with his horde of horse archers and auxiliaries. The Roman commander, Attius, rode hard to the city of Orléans with his newly found ally, Theodoric, king of the Visigoths. We simply do not know the size of their combined armies, but historians believe they were easily outnumbered by the Huns. They arrived just in time. Sangeban, the ruler of Orléans, was about to surrender to the Huns. A fierce battle began in the suburbs of the city. Attila, never afraid to retreat and regroup if things looked bleak, pulled his men out of the street fight and made for the open country. If there was to be a battle, Attila wanted it out in the open spaces where the Hun cavalry could have free reign. He pitched camp near the town of Shalom. The Huns drew up their wagon lager and prepared to crush Attias and his ragtag army. Attila made no attempt to fight until mid-afternoon. Instead, he stayed inside his wagon circle. Was he looking to provisions for his troops? Or was he playing mind games by making the Romans wait for hours in battle formation? When he finally did march, most of the daylight had gone. Romans had no difficulty in seeing the huge army which formed up behind him. Attila's plan of the attack was pretty simple, and that was to put the Huns themselves in the middle of the battle line and head as quickly and as directly across the field of battle and then tear apart the center of the enemy army. Attila placed himself in the center of the line of battle with his own Huns. On his flanks, he placed his barbarian allies, the Ostrogoths, Arderic, and Gepids. These would have been more standard cavalry, armed with spears and swords, and relying on mobility and momentum to inflict damage. On the other side of the battlefield, Attias placed his Romans on the left flank. He ordered Theodoric and his Visigoths to line up on the right flank. In the middle, he put the cowardly Sangeban. It came as no surprise when Attila prepared to strike at the weakest point of the Roman line. Romans had placed the weakest part of their force in the center. A person who was a commander of a group of barbarians who had just, in the past few weeks, been negotiating with Attila to surrender. The Romans placed that force in the middle so that they couldn't get, get away and can't, couldn't run away. That's precisely where it turned out Attila's force struck. Atlas strength hit Roman weakness. Atias was no fool. His plan was to draw Attila into the center. This would enable the left flank and the Visigoths on the right to cut off the Huns' line of retreat back to their wagon camp. It was a ruthless plan. Atias was prepared to gamble the lives of Sangeban and his men to help save the Roman Empire in the west. Attila ordered a mass cavalry charge straight at the Roman line. The Battle of Shalom was engaged. The Huns smashed into Sanjaban's troops, smack in the center of the line. Sanjaban fell back. A 
and the Huns pushed forward in pursuit. But Atias found the going tough until his tribal allies fought hard. And although the Romans hemmed them in, they did not have the sufficient numbers to completely outflank and envelop them. His idea was that if his Visigothic allies on the right and Romans and Franks on the left could sandwich in the Attila, then he could enfold them on the flanks and do some type of canine encirclement. The Visigoths had been held up by fierce resistance on the right flank. The battle was incredible in its ferocity. The casualties must have been staggering, although the, the numbers given in the, in the sources are, are just for literary effect. But surely thousands of men were perishing that day. The battle swung to and fro. Because it had begun so late in the day, the light began to fade quickly. If the Huns were able to fall back to their wagons, it would be very difficult for the Romans to attack a fortified position in the dark. It was late in the afternoon, and it was getting dark. They fought until they couldn't see each other, and then the battle continued into the darkness. It was one of these battles without end. The Visigoths chose to attack the flank of the Hun. So it was the Visigoths who saved the day. Their added weight seemed enough to turn the tide of war in Atias's favor. For now, Attila was being pressed on both flanks, and his Hun warriors were being closed down and denied the space they needed to fight effectively. Then, just as the tide of battle was swinging Rome's way, tragedy struck. In the thick of the fighting, Theodoric, king of the Visigoths, was thrown from his horse. Before he could get to his feet, he was trampled under the hooves of his own cavalry. Matthias was in a perilous position. He had lost his key ally. The Visigoths continued to fight without their king. Could he fight on in the dark? It is 451 AD. And the Roman general Atias is fighting to save Western civilization from the barbarian menace of Attila the Hun. But his key ally, Theodoric the Visigoth, has just been killed. Theodoric's son, Thorismund, now took command of the Visigoths. Luckily for Atias, the loss of their king drove them on to avenge his death. Their horsemen plowed into the ranks of the Hun army, and suddenly, it was Attila who was feeling the pressure. The Huns suffered huge casualties. With the Visigoths in full cry, the Romans found themselves with the upper hand. The only trouble was, there was no time to exploit this advantage. The sun had set, there was no more light, and chaos reigned on the battlefield of Shallow. In the darkness, forces became detached. Aetius himself, much as uh, Stonewall Jackson, got detached from his forces and was all but lost, and then found his troops. In the darkness, Thorismund mistook the Huns for his own troops and came close to being killed or captured. The Visigoths were lucky not to lose two kings in one day. Night battles are ferocious, and th the thing is, you need to dis disengage because you, you can't control the situation. Attila was able to escape to his wagon camp. The darkness had saved his army from annihilation. He had two choices, inspire his troops for another day's fierce combat, or retreat and live to fight another day. So in the, the worst hour of the Hunnish army's existence, when they were surrounded, they'd been defeated. What did uh, Attila do? He deliberately screamed, yelled, he showed his masculinity, his fearlessness, and then he actually created a funeral pyre and threatened to immolate himself. Uh, so little did he value his own life, and so much did he value, uh, value the reputation that he would die undefeated. Neither of these 
two great commanders. They didn't know what it, the casualties were that they had inflicted. They knew, however, that their own troops were terribly bloodied. These two armies had exhausted themselves. Atias probably got little sleep. He was left with a real dilemma. On the one hand, he had the opportunity to crush Attila once and for all. On the other, he had to consider the future security of the empire. The Visigoths had only supported him because of Attila's invasion. The Vandals were also unreliable. These tribes only stayed in line because of a Hun menace. Remove that and warfare could break out all over the West. There was the perception that maybe the destruction of the Hunnish army might uh, embolden other tribes that are now our allies, but after the battle will be our enemies. And back at Ravenna, the governing center of the empire, the Emperor Valentinian was worried that Atias was now the most powerful man in the West. To the people, he was the heir to the Roman generals of old. Already they were calling him the last of the Romans. The next morning, it's essentially a stalemate. The Huns are in possession of their log air, and the Romans are in possession of the battlefield, which meant that the Romans won. But the Huns were still there. The ancient sources tell us that Atias only reached his decision on the following morning when two things happened. First, the body of Theodoric was recovered, and his son Thorismund was proclaimed to be the new king of the Visigoths. Second, it was obvious that Attila was trying to pull out rather than prepare for another battle. Attila withdrew the next day because he realized that his army was in no condition once dawn uh, rose and they saw that horrific carnage on the battlefield and tens of thousands of people had been killed. He realized he was in no position to press home the attack. Atias knew his own personal standing was high. He had just beaten Attila the Hun, the scourge of Europe. But could he trust the Visigoths now that they had a new king? And what about Geyseric the Vandal? The Hun invasion had been his idea. Atias had done enough. Attila was in retreat. The West was safe. He decided to take his close-fought victory and attempt to strengthen the Roman position. I think that what the battle did was it brought people together. It brought the military and political forces of the empire in the West together one last time. The mauling that Atias gave Attila at Shalom was to prove the deciding factor. True to form, the Huns launched another lightning campaign against the Romans the following year. They swept down into Italy utterly destroying the land as they went. But a Roman counter-strike against Attila's own land across the Danube was enough to make Attila agree to a peace. He just didn't have the men to protect his borders any longer. Attias had killed too many of them at Shallow. When he finally did march, most of the daylight had gone. The Romans had no difficulty in seeing the huge army which formed up behind him. Attila's plan of the attack was pretty simple, and that was to put the Huns themselves in the middle of the battle line and head as quickly and as directly across the field of battle and then tear apart the center of the enemy army. Attila placed himself in the center of the line of battle with his own Huns. On his flanks, he placed his barbarian allies, the Ostrogoths, Arderic, and Gepids. These would have been more standard cavalry, armed with spears and swords, and relying on mobility and momentum to inflict damage. And prepared to crush Atias and his ragtag army. Attila made no attempt to fight until mid-afternoon. Instead, he stayed inside his wagon circle. Was he looking to provisions for his troops? Or was he playing mind games by making the Romans wait for hours in battle formation? It is 451 AD. Attila had destroyed everything in his path as he galloped through Gaul with his horde of horse archers and auxiliaries. The Roman commander, Atias, rode hard to the city of Orléans with his newly found ally, Theodoric, king of the Visigoths. 
We simply do not know the size of their combined armies, but historians believe they were easily outnumbered by the Huns. They arrived just in time. Sanjaban, the ruler of Orléans, was about to surrender to the Huns. A fierce battle began in the suburbs of the city. Attila, never afraid to retreat and regroup if things looked bleak, pulled his men out of the street fight and made for the open country. If there was to be a battle, Attila wanted it out in the open spaces where the Hun cavalry could have free reign. He pitched camp near the town of Chalon. The Huns drew up their wagon lager 